Well, I had the privilege of um, sharing lunch with our keynote speaker today, and I, you're in for a treat. Um, not only does he sound like James Earl Jones, um, which made me want him to just, just keep talking, because I just wanted to hear it, um, but the content is going to be outstanding. Um, we're pleased to uh, have another one of our business people, kind of a new business in the Grand Rapids market, that made this opportunity um, available to us today, and that's Epitech out of the uh, Detroit market. And so I'd like to have Tony come up and introduce our speaker today. Tony? so much, Rick, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tony Holloman, Executive Vice President with Epitech. As uh, Rick had mentioned, we are the Detroit market, but uh, we're a national firm uh, providing IT and engineering talent. And, uh, you know, thank you, Bill Gates over there, for uh, exposing kind of the issue that not only Epitech deals with, but the manpowers of the world, the tech systems. All of us are dealing with this gap, um, and it's partly exciting, but at the same rate, you know, we're also faced with a lot of the work that we deal with on the technical side going overseas if we don't create uh, additional um, 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 critical mass, you know, from a human resources standpoint. So, um, but I had opportunity to uh, uh, meet with uh, the gentleman that I'm about to introduce, uh, and uh, that opportunity came out of another partnership that we have with Ford Motor Company. So I wanted to say thank you, Gwen, uh, more for making the introduction um, uh, our relationship with uh, NACME, um, uh, we're a corporate council member. Uh, it gives us an opportunity to have line of sight uh, to a lot of what Dr. McPhail is going to talk to talk to you guys about today. You know, with his organization, National Action Council for Minority Engineers, uh, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. McPhail, who's the current president and chief executive offer, uh, officer for NACME. Uh, NACME serves as a catalyst to increase. Uh, the pro promotion of African Americans, uh, American Indian, and Latino young women and men in STEM careers. Uh, working at, at the nexus of practice, policy, and research in literacy education, post-secondary uh, student success, un, uh, underrepresented minorities in STEM and higher education leadership. Dr. McPhail has dedicated his career to education and student development. And uh, again, you know, join me in welcoming Dr. McPhail. Thank you. Thank you. Like, like, like Bill Gates, I work for an engineering education organization, but I'm not an engineer. Uh, but uh, so I have to have some help. <clears throat> I'm delighted to be here, delighted to share some perspectives this afternoon on diversity and inclusion through the lens of engineering education and what this means for business and for competitiveness and for all of the issues and concerns that beset uh, our corporate communities. I'd like to first of all thank Rick and the leadership of the chamber for this opportunity uh, to address you this afternoon and to be here to learn a lot about uh, West Michigan, some of the issues and challenges that you're facing, and also to explore with you how there might be some alignment going forward between the issues and concerns that my organization has been focused on for the past four decades and more, and some of the business concerns related to engineering and technology here in West Michigan. Also like to thank the sponsors and all of the supporters uh, for this event, and most especially to my uh, new colleague and friend, uh, Tony Holloman, for making uh, this opportunity possible. And as he has mentioned, also to Gwen uh, Moore from Ford, uh, Motor Company, who was a member of our board of directors, uh, for introducing NACME to Epitet so that Epitet could introduce NACME to the chamber. And so we have, we have a lot of synergy that's going on here uh, and it's very, very uh, effective and very, very important for the work that we're, that we're doing. Now, Roger has actually uh, uh, suggested a number of very, very interesting perspectives that serve as a kind of interesting predicate, if you will, for some of the uh, information I'd like to share and discuss with you. Uh, I'm very, very pleased, and one of the things that Roger talked about a lot was the community college. Uh, one of the things that I'm very, very proud of is that for 15 years, I served as chancellor or president at two very large community colleges, one in Baltimore County uh, and one in St. Louis, Missouri. And so I agree uh, that the community college is not only an important partner with business, uh, and with the other uh, components of the education sector, 
but that the STEM work being done today in community colleges is very, very vital uh, to produce uh, the kinds of, of talent uh, that Roger talked about that is needed here in West Michigan and needed throughout the state and throughout the nation. I'm going to focus on another part of that STEM continuum, and that is specifically engineering careers and baccalaureate degree programs and above. And the realities that also exist in our nation to increase substantially the number of young people who choose that particular pathway, I like his notion of pathway, engineering representing yet another dimension of that pathway concept, uh, who choose to go into engineering. And some of the challenges that we face in the United States as a consequence of some of the diversity and inclusion conundrum that besets our nation as we attempt to figure out how to move more persons into engineering from those groups who have been historically underrepresented. That has been the focus of my organization, National Action Council for Minorities in Engineering, for the past 43 years. And so we want to explore that a little bit and to talk about how NACME, in collaboration with business industry, uh, technology, engineering companies here in this part, very, very vital part of the state, might be able to partner in addressing some of these very, very critical concerns. And so first of all, let's take a national kind of perspective and a national picture. We'll move from national to state to local, but I want to begin with sort of what the, what the view looks like from 50,000 feet. NACME's founding vision was to be a vital part of creating with other stakeholders in collaboration an engineering workforce that looks like America, right? Pretty powerful concept, right? An engineering workforce that looks like America. Not controversial particularly, uh, aspirational certainly, uh, but something that we feel is critical to maintaining the preeminence of the United States in STEM, particularly now that the level of competition from other nations, other technology infrastructures around the world is increasing at an almost exponential rate. So at NACME, I have been concerned for some time with this notion of proportionality, as well as uh, with the notion of parity. When NACME was founded originally in 1974, a very, very important part of the ethos, if you will, of NACME's formation was this notion of achieving parity. Parity between the representation of those groups who have significantly been underrepresented in engineering and their representation in the American demographic reality at that time and continuing to today. The most recent valid data is 2014. And here you have two charts, uh, two pie charts that kind of show uh, in reality the level of the challenge that we face. On the left, engineering bachelor's degree produ production, okay, deconstructed around individual diversity groups. And then on the right-hand side, the proportion of those same groups in the U.S. demographic as of 2014. And one can see very, very clearly that for those three groups that NACME historically has represented, African American, Latino, American Indian slash Alaska Native. The variance between these numbers is rather startling, would you agree? Okay. Now, put this in the context of another reality. And that reality is, as all of us know, by the year 2050, it has been predicted, there will be no one majority racial or ethnic group in the United States. The United States is increasingly becoming a nation with significant diversity as its defining characteristic. For us at NACME, for us here in this room, 
And for all of us concerned about not only the equity issues involved in this, but the pure economic issues around competitiveness, these kinds of numbers and these kinds of outcomes present a rather poignant challenge. Simply stated, we need to move more young people into pathways that will lead them to engineering careers, particularly from those groups that are not now on a pathway resulting in this kind of data and presentation. Let's look at it another way. NACME was founded back in 1974, which means that around 77 or 78, we produced our first group of baccalaureate degree holding underrepresented minority students with bachelor's degrees in engineering. And you kind of see the progression all the way through to 2014 in terms of what the national numbers suggest. The blue line, women in engineering, the green line combined underrepresented minorities in engineering. Again, the three focal points of NACME, African-American, Latino, American Indian, Alaska, Alaska Native. Very interesting story. To say that no progress has been made, obviously, uh, would be spurious. Clearly, if we start from four and 6% to where we are today, there in fact has been progress. And NACME is very proud of the fact that our scholarships and other strategies that we have been engaged in since our formation uh, have led and have contributed, we think, in significant measure to the increases that you see in terms of underrepresented minority representation in engineering at the baccalaureate degree. But again, if we go back to the earlier chart, as well as to all of the other demographic information that you know very well, clearly these numbers represent a problem and a challenge. We are nowhere near the issue of parity in terms of underrepresented minority participation rates in engineering. And if we look at the participation rates of women, clearly the participation rates of women in the American workforce generally, as well as in the availability at the undergraduate education level and beyond suggest that that number also is in fact problematic. So on both scores, there is significant work that needs to be done. Now let's delve a little bit deeply, more deeply. Here we have some ASCE data uh, that kind of looks at each of these uh, groups in, in some more uh, detail. I think the story here for women in engineering uh, is apparent. Uh, I particularly point out that in terms of the workforce comparison, as well as representation in the U.S. population, as well as that rather significant number, 48.8% in the U.S. college age population, clearly some significant work to be done. African Americans in engineering, uh, looking across the same, same matrix, same uh, basic uh, uh, argument and same basic conclusion. Uh, both in, term, uh, in terms of faculty, workforce representation, all the way down, uh, clearly challenges before our nation in terms of being able to move this particular segment of the population more into a pathway toward engineering degrees. I mentioned that we also support American Indian Alaska Natives in engineering. Obviously, the numbers there are smaller in terms of the absolute numbers in population, but again, the same basic argument obtains the notion of a mirror image between participation and population demographic clearly out of sync. And then the Latino numbers. We talk a lot in our nation about the exponential growth of the Latino population, which is an absolute fact. Uh, we talk about uh, that in a number of ways, but if we simply look at that from the perspective of engineering, I mean, even though 21.4% or so Latinos are available for higher education, significant 17.5% representation, at least in 2014, of the U.S. population, even though the engineering workforce number, the faculty number, and the bachelor's degree numbers are all larger than the numbers for African Americans, let us say, or American Indian Alaska Natives, logic would, would still suggest that we are nowhere near where we need to be especially given the unique increases in the Latino population in the United States. 
So if, in fact, Latinos are going to more actively participate in engineering, education, and careers, clearly there is a lot of work to be done. Now let's go to the, the state focus, or perhaps more of a local focus. When I have the opportunity to talk to groups and colleagues uh, around the country, I always want to reflect on how the national numbers relate to what is happening locally, what is happening in a more familiar context. And I found uh, these particular numbers to be, to be intriguing. And I thank uh, members of the, uh, of the chamber for sending me uh, this data and research uh, to my research team to try, to try to figure out exactly what we thought was going on here. Well, the interesting thing that's going on, and it has been suggested in, in Roger's comments and Rick's comments and everything that I've learned since uh, 2 o'clock this morning when I arrived in, 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 in your great city, is that there's a lot of very interesting things happening in engineering and technology in Western Michigan. Look at how you compare, for example, between 2011 and 2016 with the rest of the nation. Okay, lots of opportunity, lots of challenge, lots of focus on innovation, lots of very, very interesting, exciting things occurring in this part of the world in driving engineering and technology. But I also found another chart. And again, uh, from my colleagues here in the chamber, and this chart suggests, again, uh, something very interesting, something consistent, something that aligns with the earlier national data, and that is with that growth, that rather important growth in the opportunity for jobs in engineering in your part of the world, we are not seeing the participation rates of the groups that NACME again represents, African American, Latino, American Indian, slash Alaska Native, those numbers are in fact very, very small. So the challenge then is, as the American demographic reality is changing, so will the demographic reality in Michigan, so will the demographic reality in West Michigan. The question then is, how do we bridge the gap between the current reality and the reality we know must exist if in fact your companies, your global, local engineering and technology companies are going to be able to source the talent that they need in order to remain globally competitive. Okay, now, why is any of this important to begin with? And I know that everyone in this room uh, by virtue of your participation in this conference, uh, your interest in talent, uh, your understanding of what it takes to develop and to grow and to enhance and to develop talent fully understands that diversity is an asset. We have now lots of data and information to substantiate and to validate the importance of diverse teams, for example, outperforming homogeneous teams, uh, how diverse opinions drives a greater degree of innovation. I mean, the research, the data is there. Uh, I was thinking, for example, about uh, uh, McKinsey Group. You've all seen their work. Uh, Catalyst, uh, there's a recent study out of the Peterson Institute uh, that looks at what happens in terms of the bottom line for companies when they engage more women executives, for example. Um, just a lot of data. It, 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 it's a point now where to argue that, well, no, diversity is just, you know, some social construct that represents some kind of dimension of, of uh, you know, liberal or correct thinking is insane. I mean, we're talking about the wherewithal, financially and otherwise, of Western Michigan and the companies in Western Michigan that are trying to drive and stay competitive in the engineering and STEM space. We know the diversity, without it, a loss of talent, and we certainly know that in terms of, of economic growth and global competitiveness, it is in fact an important thing to do. Now, how then might my organization work with the chamber, work with Roger, work with the corporations that are represented in this room in addressing some of the very issues that these data charts present. 
So just a little bit more about who we are today at NACME. I've given you a sense of how we started, but who are we today? Today we are an organization that is focused like a laser on exactly what this summit is focused on, and that is the development of talent. In fact, in our new strategic plan, the theme of our new strategic plan is college to career. And by college to career, our focus is how can we move more NACME scholars into internship experiences and full-time engineering jobs with the 33 global engineering and technology companies today that comprise the NACME Board of Directors and with the five uh, companies that comprise the NACME Corporate Council. How can we do that? So, scholarships remains the primary KRA for NACME, okay? I have some numbers on, on the next chart, you'll see that, but we, we are a major provider of undergraduate scholarships for underrepresented minority students pursuing bachelor's degrees in engineering. We work with a network of 48 universities around the United States. These are universities that have made a particular commitment to grow the diversity of their undergraduate engineering classes and to work with NACME collaboratively to implement best practice and to make use of the financial resources that for about half of those universities, NACME makes available to recruit, enroll, educate, retain, and graduate increasing numbers of underrepresented minority students. Here in the state of Michigan, we have the University of Michigan is among the 48. Michigan Tech is among the 48. We just admitted Wayne State University now among the 48. There's only one university missing, right? <laughs> the university right here in your hometown. So hopefully uh, we're going to have some time tonight at dinner with the Dean of Engineering at your local university and hopefully we're going to be able to convince your local university dean of engineering that indeed he wishes to become a part of this national network of 48 universities. Now these universities are also significant for a number, another reason. Annually, think about this now, annually, this network of 48 universities produces anywhere from 30 to 32 percent of the total number a bachelor's degrees earned by underrepresented minorities in all of the disciplines in engineering. This is a very, very unique group of engineering universities that have joined forces with NACME with the support of our corporate partners like Ford Motor Company and Epitet in driving this initiative. Career Center, we are now utilizing at NACME and evolving in a very dynamic way, the NACME Career Center, with a more concentrated focus, as I indicated earlier, in creating internship opportunities and full-time hiring opportunities for our NACME scholars. How does this relate to my audience here today uh, in Western Michigan? We would love to partner with the engineering and technology companies here in your city, in this region, create an opportunity to partner with NACME, and as a consequence of that, move more NACME scholars from around the nation into internship experiences with your companies. Because we know from our research that a successfully completed inter internship experience has a high probability of leading to an offer for a first-time, full-time job in engineering. We have the talent. Almost sound like that commercial from Arby's. We have, the, we have the talent, okay? We have the talent. Great. What do you mean we have the talent? Our NACME scholars, 1,300 of whom or so we support every year, 3.3 grade point average on a 4.0 scale, 79.2% six-year graduation rate, and I challenge you to compare 79.2% of 
against the six-year retention rates of engineers generally, and specifically against the six-year retention rate of minority engineers who are not a part of the NACME Scholar Program. Again, we are a group of engineers. We're an engineering education organization. Every number I give you is valid. Every number I give you can be verified and validated. We have good talent. And what we want to do is to make that talent available to help drive innovation, excellence, diversity, and inclusion in your companies so that you can have the benefit that derives from that commitment. Here are some of the numbers. I've talked about some of these. Uh, we've given a lot of money away. We've helped a lot of kids become engineers. Uh, annually, we're supporting about $5.5 million in scholarships. Over our 43 years, we've been engaged with 160 colleges and universities. But today, again, our national partner university network consists of 48 institutions. Now, best practices. What have we learned? As you can imagine, 48, 43 years of being the lead organization engaged in producing diversity and inclusion in engineering has put us in a position to do a lot of research, a lot of program evaluation, and to learn a lot about what really does it take to produce successfully a minority engineer. Let's first of all look at some general characteristics uh, that come out of just a generic study uh, from National Science Foundation. Financial support, very, very important. NACME is providing that. Professional support, social support, on down the line. These are variables that I think all of you probably you know, would have suggested, uh, just given your knowledge of education or, or, or a development of students and the like. One thing about c combating stereotype threat uh, some of you may say, what, what, what is that? Well, you know, uh, stereotype threat is this, this notion that a minority student or woman may inculcate a negative uh, expectation in terms of their own performance based on stereotypes that are held about that particular group or gender. So, for example, women don't do well in math, and then you give a group of female students a mathematics test. And the research has demonstrated that where stereotype threat is operating, that might depress the level of performance of female students. Or African Americans uh, can never learn physics. No, I don't know why, why you're taking this course. African American, there, there are no African American physicists. Group of African American students taking a physics test, stereotype threat may have the impact of depressing performance. But here's the good news about stereotype threat. The good news about stereotype threat is that there's another body of research that argues rather forcefully how elastic the brain is, right? How if you put something into the brain, if you provide experiences for students, doesn't make any difference if they're female, African American, Latino, American Indian, or Alaska Native. Give them the opportunity, use this information to help shape curriculum, and any student can learn anything. So whereas stereotype threat may be an issue or concern, there are things that our universities and that all of us can do to make certain that it has not become a debilitating factor for our students. So I put that there because I would be remiss giving you the research if I didn't include it. My argument is we have students every day who defy whatever might be the debilitating impact of stereotype threat. Now to our study, to our own NACME study, we recently received a three-year grant from the National Science Foundation. We wanted to go into the universities, a subset of them, that educate our NACME scholars and find out, well, how is it that our NACME scholars are able to achieve those GPAs, are able to achieve those retention rates, are able to literally blow the ceiling off of academic achievement in engineering education, which ain't easy, engineering education, excuse the aim. Here's what we found. Factors that were identified by the students, math, obviously, a love of math, skill in math, problem solving ability, all of it, I want to come back to psychological resilience, and then for the institutions, 
A lot of work that's been verified, a lot of research, Yuri Treisman stuff out at Berkeley. We know the study groups, group work, all of that works, and then the hands-on experience. Internships, working, okay, five minutes, got it. Hands-on experience, uh, you know, sort of a, a project-based learning, problem-based learning. Let me come back to psychological resilience. This popped up in the factor analysis. It's a kind of strange kind of finding. I mean, we sat there, we tried to figure out, we didn't know quite what to do with this. So we gave it the, ter we gave it the label, psychological resilience. But the more we thought about it, what it really means is these are kids who just would not give up. You put whatever roadblock or barrier in front of them that you want, you know what their attitude was? I came here to be an engineer. I'm going to graduate as an engineer. So all of the things that we think that get in the way, yes, they shouldn't be there, but psychological resilience proved itself to be a statistically significant factor in our analysis for the success of our students. OK, actually, I was almost at the end. So. Um, that's it. Um, again, my, my, she says five minutes, and I'm like, oh, I thought I was near there. Um, again, my, my, my message, I'm happy to be here. Uh, again, with only four hours of sleep, no problem. Um, I'm energized by this group. I'm energized by the lunch, uh, energized by the, the conversation, by the questions, by the commitment that West, West Michigan has to adding to all of the other excellence that was talked about by Roger and Rick and everyone else in terms of the data, adding to that a firm commitment to growing diversity and inclusion in your global engineering and technology enterprise. The data clearly would suggest that doing so would take West Michigan to an even higher level of accomplishment than it is today. But at the same time, we'll hope to drive a firm commitment to U.S. competitiveness, which is needed now perhaps more than ever. NACME wants to be your partner in getting there. Let's please have some dialogue at some point about how we can join forces and make that happen. Thank you.